Hello, Buddhist Geeks. This is Vincent Horn, and I'm joined today over Google Hangout with our special guest of today, Matt Bieber. Matt, great to have you on the show, and uh, th thanks for joining us from, is it Vietnam that you're staying in right now? Yep, I'm in Saigon, Vietnam. Awesome. So if our internet connection gets a little choppy, you'll understand why. Um, this is a bit of a, a stretch in terms of you know, distance. Um, I don't think you can get really much further than you know, uh, North Carolina and Saigon. Um, so, but, but it should be totally fine. So yeah, anyway, just want to introduce Matt a little bit before we jump into the topic, which is the politics of Buddha nature. Um, so Matt is a political author, writer. He writes at thewheatandchaff.com. Some very interesting articles of his own, as well as interviews with very interesting folks. Um, and is also a Buddhist practitioner and has studied. Uh, tell me a little bit about your background in the Buddhist world. I know, I know you told me a bit about your teacher, but maybe you could share with, with the rest of us kind of what, what your interest is there and what you've been up to. Sure. So I had been at the Kennedy School uh, studying for a public policy master's and uh, was just a bit frustrated with. Um, the speed of the whole learning environment and realized that um, I wanted a space in which I could sort of slow down and think a little bit more clearly and precisely about a whole bunch of ethical questions related to community and individual development. Um, so I uh, applied to a second program at Harvard Divinity School, um, began studying there, and while there, um, on a lark actually, just to fulfill a requirement, began taking a course on Buddhist ethics. Um, in that class, I met uh, a, a friend, a, a guy who's become a best friend named John Winter, um, and we quickly became close. He quickly began sharing a great deal about his own study and path, and I was enamored of mostly just talking with him and sort of exploring um, sets of questions that it turned out we both shared. Um, at some point, he introduced me to his teacher, Lee Ray, who is a uh, was a student of Chogyam Trungpa and uh, lives in Boulder, Colorado. Um, I went out and visited a few times and, and uh, began considering her my teacher and have been practicing under her for, I guess, the better part of two years now. So in the in the lineage of Chogyam Trungpa. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. And you know, one of the things that you mentioned um, on your on your blog and one of the articles that I, I really enjoyed reading. Uh, was about your experience, um, this is now on the political side, of being an intern at the White House and doing some speech writing for uh, Vice President Joe Biden. And that was quite interesting because you, in describing what it was like, I felt like you did a pretty good job at, at not pulling any punches, at being honest about what, what it was like to be a speech writer and how those speeches were handled. And I was wondering if you could share a bit about, you know, like kind of the gems, um, you know, from that experience. Because I think you know, for most of us, we have really no sense of what that world is like, um, except through, you know, through the way that it's portrayed, you know, on television or online, you know, through the New York Times or whatever. So sure. you know, maybe you could tell us what it's like in the belly of the beast. <laughs> well, I think the single most shocking thing to me was how few um, layers there were between me and a finalized speech. Um, the president, at least at the time I was there, had seven speechwriters. Uh, the vice president had one, and that meant that um, because I was working for the vice president's speechwriter, um, I would get uh, I would get essentially the runoff, and I don't mean that critically, but you know he's a busy guy, so I would uh, I would at some point early on began to get to write speeches and was really shocked at how at least the the low profile speeches were often approved with um, almost no editing. Um, and that's not to say people weren't scrupulous uh, about what got said, it, but it's just to say that everyone was very busy and um, apparently what I wrote passed muster. And I was sh sort of shocked um, because I was writing from my heart. I was basically seeing what I could try to, or I was often curious about what I could get away with. I wanted to speak as, as earnestly and honestly as I could, um, not to, not to you know, ask him to misrepresent himself or anything like that, but to to kind of inject ideas into the discourse and sort of see whether the the staff would allow them to get approved, and oftentimes they were, which was, um, uh, but <laughs> of course the flip side of that is um, getting a finalized speech, you know, into his hands didn't necessarily mean that he actually read it at the podium. He's a you know, as everyone knows, is, is sort of famous for his improvisations, and um, you know, he's the he's the boss. So there was that too. So, so sometimes you're you're 
what you got into his hands just wouldn't be he wouldn't use it. Yeah, there were a couple. The first couple of speeches I wrote for him, um, I you know I remember um, I was so excited. I went to the auditorium to watch the speeches, and um, you know he he unfolded the, the the speech, and the first thing he said the first thing he said was. Um, you know, my staff has prepared some very lovely remarks, but uh, I think, you know, I think I'm, I'd like to say some other things. He just folded the speech back up, um, put it back in his pocket, and then w winged it, essentially, for the next 40 minutes. Um, and, uh, you know, and that was just part and parcel of, of how it went. Um, I went back and, and, you know, shared that with, uh, with my boss, the speechwriter. <laughs> you know, he, he'd obviously been through it a bunch of times, so it wasn't a big surprise to him. Gotcha. And, you know, another thing you mentioned in that article, which I thought was, it made sense to hear it, but it's it's one thing to, to kind of suspect this is the case, it's another to hear a first-person description, is you were describing, you know, the, the, the nature of the hierarchy and the way that power works on Capitol Hill. And I wondered if you could say, not just in terms of also, you know, popular people you see on TV, but also in terms of the whole hierarchy you know, beneath that person, you know, aides and all that. Could you say a bit about that? Yeah, I've I've never been in an environment um, that was that self-conscious of rank, in which everyone knew where they stood. Um, and you know, this is a huge organization. Even the White House itself. Um, forget all the federal agencies that the president oversees, but just the White House complex itself is. Um, you know, a great many buildings with a great many offices, and um, it, it really felt like status was um, both incredibly fine-grained, um, but also incredibly um, visible, incredibly uh, legible, I guess. Um, and that's not to say, I, I don't mean to say that people were mean, or that they threw their weight around, or, um, you know, treated, and treat, you know, that I, I didn't see anyone treated badly or anything like that. Um, but it was bizarre to me how um, how everyone seemed aware of proximity of um, how much power they were close to, and one of the uh, the anecdote that I used in the story or in the essay was um, was the photos that were on the wall. Um, so basically, everywhere throughout the White House complex, um, there are these huge framed, you know, two and a half or three feet by two feet, say. Um, photos of the president, the vice president, um, often with other people around. And at a certain point, I began. It, it began. It became striking. Um, like, do we really need to be reminded? You know, we know. Everybody knows. We work for these guys. Um, do do we need them sort of looking down from every wall? Um, and I don't. You know, I don't. Mean, that's not a sort of um, a backhanded or sort of sly way of, of critiquing them for, I mean, this is a standard practice in White House, it's just to have these photos up. Um, but it, it struck me as um, reinforcing a kind of um, closed and inward looking and perhaps defensive and self-protective mentality, um, as opposed to what I thought would perhaps have been a more useful um, set of reminders, you know, a picture of a struggling family in a in a, a city on the slide, or someone, an activist on the march that we felt in solidarity with, something like that. There's something about that constant reminder that we're the White House, we're the president, we're the White House, we're the president, that um, felt like it was reinforcing unhealthy uh, attitudes more than it was helping motivate. Okay, okay. Now, I can't help but ask this question, because as you're describing that, you know, the question that comes to mind is like, how is that different? From the Buddhist communities out there, um, I mean, granted, not all of them are the same. Not all of them are the White House. But you know what you're describing. You know, I I've seen that play out at several places. You know, where you've got pictures of the guru all over the place, staring at you from every wall, and a kind of unhealthy, you know, separation and a hyper awareness of the pecking order. You know, who's a senior student and who's you know a junior student. <laughs> um, just curious. You know, would you would you would you say maybe some of that? Observation could be, uh, you know, applied toward toward the religious uh, space as well. I'm sure it could. Um, I've only been I've been in a smaller number of communities than you have, and so the one, the really the only one that I have extensive experience with, um, is not. I think has probably fewer of those challenges than than others. Um, but I, I also think there's a substantive difference, uh, at least in a lot of cases, um, which is to say that. Um, 
at its best, the Buddhist tradition and the tradition of the teacher or the guru, depending on which tradition you're talking about, um, is not meant to be looked up to or worshipped or um, you know kowtowed to um, as as sort of an entity in and of themselves, so much as uh, as, as, as a vessel for the teachings themselves, so that these teachers become revered um, at their best because they faithfully transmit something that's deep and true and abiding and, and helpful to people. Um, I think politics is a little different in that um, because it's so combative, because it's so zero-sum, um, loyalty gets expressed or, or gets... Um, um, the loyalty that I saw expressed there was toward a man and toward a leader, um, but what he said on any given day might change, you know, given the vicissitudes of the politics that he, he was dealing with, given what his opponents were doing. I wouldn't say that it was quite the same, that it represented quite the same fidelity to um, a set of constant, permanent teachings. Um, and I think because it doesn't, it ends up inevitably tending a little bit more toward personality worship than, than it necessarily might in Buddhist communities. Okay, okay. That's a... I think that's a, an optimistic assessment of Buddhist communities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, like I said, I've been, I've been pretty pleased in the community that I'm in, so yeah. I, you know, I've heard the horror stories too, so I don't want to make any blanket uh, you know, distinctions between the world of polit politics and the world of Buddhism, for sure. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think that's fair because in, in the Buddhist world or in the... You could even say now in the emerging mindfulness world, which is which is somewhat different but also related, um, there are so many different you know kind of small communities that are operating almost in isolation and have very different structures and politics and um, and hierarchies and all of that. So, um, mm -hmm. but even at some of the traditional ones, I think you know they have a lot of the characteristics you're describing. Maybe not the the constant flip flopping of views, um, but but definitely some of the some of the idolization. Yeah. Um, Cool. So you know, let's get into the politics of uh, Buddha nature, and what I mean by that is, you know, one of the things that you're really kind of interested in and are writing about and are exploring is this notion of bringing to bear, you know, the teachings on and the understanding of Buddha nature to the political sphere, mm -hmm. um, and seeing how that might impact or change, you know, the nature of politics. And I guess before I ask the obvious question, which is like, well, how does that work? I, I first maybe should ask, what do you mean by um, Buddha nature? Right. So I've been realizing, as my own reading has um, expanded, that um, that when I talk comfortably about Buddha nature within my own tradition, it's it's pretty different than doing so outside the bounds of those of that uh, of that uh, Tibetan tradition. So what I mean by that is. Um, a basic goodness, uh, a basic compassion and openness and awareness, and responsiveness to suffering, um, the kind of thing that doesn't require conceptualization um, but knows what to do and how to do it um, prior to conceptualization. And that's something that I um, have a fairly strong notion is, is, in, is in all of us uh, at some level, buried perhaps fairly deep down, but in there nonetheless. Okay, so it's sort sort of something that's there, but you you know have to like it's obscured is the kind of way I've heard it talked about you know in the Tibetan tradition like it's it's like the sun behind the clouds and you kind of have to you know figure out how to how to peer behind those things. Yeah, something like that. That there's um, that there's all this ego activity on top. There's all this uh, confusion and ignorance. Um, there's all this effort to perpetuate ourselves and to get what we want and. You know all the traditional hamster wheel spinning in samsara, um, but that but that right underneath uh, there's a wiser part of us that that is at least marginally aware that of the silliness of the game that we're playing and and wants out and wants something better both for ourselves and for others. Cool. And what's your experience with this? <laughs> so here's where I have to just issue all my caveats right out of the gate. Um, you know, pretty minimal, to be honest with you, but also, um, but, but also s mm, substantive enough to give me, to give me confidence um, for, the, for somebody like me, you know, and I imagine a lot of your, at least some portion of your listeners are the same, you're really analytical people that have often put a lot of faith in book learning and uh, logic and analysis, 
it's been a real shock to be exposed to a set of teachings that basically says the best parts of you are um, may work in tandem with all those things, but are also um, are also different. Are also um, that your compassion uh, is sort of there, ready to act um, beneath all of that, and doesn't really require the assistance of of your analytical mind. Um, that's that's all really shocking stuff for me, but it's also stuff that I've gotten some glimpses of over the past couple of years, both in myself through uh, my own practice and through encountering people who, um, namely my namely my teacher, but uh, others of her students um, who are present to others, um, care for others, and are capable of dealing really skillfully with others in a way that is really beyond anything I've ever seen anywhere else. Uh, and so that gives me some faith, too. Mm, OK, gotcha. So um, what what had you want to start kind of taking this experience and idea and kind of thinking about how it might impact politics? Like, was there a certain, was there a particular moment that you started thinking that? Or was it sort of from the very beginning, you just kind of saw, saw the way that those two might might interact? Well, as you as you alluded to before our conversation, you know, I've been a I think it's totally fair to say a political junkie all my life, and a frustrated one um, because I've I've found myself both drawn to politics and all the possibility that it has to do good and make meaningful differences in in people's lives, and you know, also frustrated by the ways that it seems to consistently go bad. Um, so I've been thinking about this sort of thing for quite a while, and you know, had had. Um, studied a lot of Gandhi, studied a lot of Martin Luther King, uh, studied the best that I could find, uh, the best teachers that I could find in, in, our, in our politics um, for clues as to what, what kinds of failures, what kinds of consistent mistakes we might be making um, that, would, that would render a politics of so much possibility uh, so often moot or, or um, kind of neutralize the, all the good it might do. Um, to me, learning about the kleshas, learning about the basic, uh, you know, Buddhist, uh, according to the Buddhist view, the old unwholesome states of mind, um, really came as a revelation and a, a sort of a, a fresh wind of clarity in my thinking about this stuff. Um, you know, as you know, the, the, we have this idea that um, ignorance, attachment, and aversion, uh, or if you're in a different tradition, delusion, greed, and hatred. Um, form the kind of triumvirate of nasty states of mind that foul up our relationships with ourselves and others and create all sorts of uh, painful situations in the world. And, and as you know, these are uh, ideas that are, they're sort of like the triune God in, in Christianity. They're uh, both separable and, you know, we can think about them separately and think about them separately, but we can also recognize that they all come from a common source, which is uh, the mistake of dualism of imagining that we're all separate selves running around and that the best we can do and all we can ever really hope to do is sort of look after ourselves and try to defend ourselves against others. And, and the more I started thinking about this and reading about it and receiving teachings about it, it started to become fairly clear to me that um, the stuff that the Buddhist world is most wary of, these kleshas, is exactly the stuff that our politics is built on. Our politics isn't worried about dualism, it's not worried about greed, it's not worried about uh, hatred and aversion, it's actually positively built on these things in a lot of ways uh, and affirms them positively as, uh, as goals to be pursued and as ideals to be sought. And when I realized that, or when I began to think that that might be the case, I thought, my goodness, um, we, we've got the world literally turned upside down. Okay, interesting. And, you know, this is something I've heard not, not with respect to politics, um, you know, from another guest, but but in terms of institutions, you know, we were talking to uh, David Loy, and he he talked about many large institutions, uh, in particular, like large corporations, for instance, are sort of institutionalizing these core places. Um, it sounds like you're saying something similar about your experience of of the political institution. I am, and I'm in particular referring to. Um the, the rhetoric that burns um, the sort of rhetorical boundaries of our contemporary political discourse and also the political philosoph philosophical tradition out of which our contemporary situation emerges. So that would be the, the major thinkers in the Western liberal philosophical tradition. 
Um, if you look at, the, at many of them, um, particularly the post-Enlightenment thinkers, and if you also look at the, found, the basic premises that are shot through our contemporary discourse, it's pretty clear that, for the most part, we all take, we all take for granted that um, we are atomistic, fairly atomistic individuals, um, and that um, seeking our own interests, pursuing our own interests, will naturally bring us into deep and perhaps irremediable conflict with others. Um, and that the best, and this is what's really depressing to me, that the best we can hope to do um, from a political, organizational, structural perspective is manage that conflict with a minimum of actual violence. Um, to my mind, that sets the, the ambitions incredibly low. Uh, it, it sets the bar incredibly low. All we're, all we've, the best we can hope to do is stay away from each other's throats. And that, I think the Buddhist tradition and the Buddhist insights about, about psychology offer genuine reason for hope that much more than that is possible. Okay. Okay, this is where it gets interesting because um, I'm totally with you on that. And at the same time, I think it's fair to say, like, if we look back through history, you know, at different Buddhist cultures, um, it's not the case so much that they've, you know, that we have any clear and shining examples of, you know, of a Buddhist culture that's been able to, like, um, deal with the complexities of modern life and at the same time bring forth some of these deeper values. So I guess the question is, you know, what what is it within Buddhism that could be applied, you know, to the political sphere or change the way we're thinking? Um, like, is there a particular Buddhist philosophical, you know, uh, Buddhist po political kind of idea that, that's out there that seems really promising? Or are there any models? Or, you know, kind of what do you look for to, you know, in terms of, in terms of hope of actually um, implementing something like that, like actually seeing it become real as opposed to, um, you know, more, more of a kind of uh, nice idea, I guess. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, before I try to answer it, I want to ask you one. Um, sure. And that is, what do you see as distinctive about the challenges of modern life that might require a different or more sophisticated application of these principles than might have been necessary in the past? Um, I, I definitely several things come to mind. One is um, the hyper connectivity and the way that we interface with technology constantly, um, mm -hmm. and what comes out of that is a very different experience. I think of being human. Um, at least it has been for me, even since the internet, you know, came, came online. Um, uh, I think the other thing, like you're saying, is that it's the very framework that we're in. You know, we're in this, like you said atomistic, individualistic society, you know, where that is kind of from the very beginning, that's kind of the idea that you have of who you are and, and what the world is. Um, and also, you know, there's other invisible kinds of structures like, um, you know, economic structures um, that were vastly different than, than anything that Buddhist philosophy came out of. Um, and, and those are all sort of things that are taken for granted. And I think change, you know, probably in a lot of ways how we interact with the world um, you know, we're, we're, we're maybe more consumers than we are, you know, humans uh, first in a lot of cases, mm -hmm. a lot of contexts, um, though, though not in private usually. Um, I don't know. Those, those are some of the things that come to mind as being kind of different about the modern world. Um, Fair enough. So let me dive into some of that. Um, yeah, please. The first thing I'd say is that I, I'm not well-versed enough in... Uh, Asian history, Buddhist history, to, to feel comfortable offering an example of, um, of a society where they've really nailed it and gotten it right. Mm -hmm. um, and in a way, I think that's okay, because the, I think that, and I don't think this is where you were coming from or anything like that, but um, from a more skeptical audience, that's often, that there's, um, you, might, you might offer that question uh, from a more skeptical perspective, or even more dismissive perspective, and say, um, hey, look, uh, you know, has anyone ever actually been successful in applying this stuff? And let's suggest, let's say the answer is no, that nobody's ever gotten it totally right um, or even implemented this, this stuff in the main. Um, I, I think I'd still want to say um, there's still a lot of reason to think about it because if we're at all honest with ourselves, we're very, we're very aware with, uh, um, of the, the profound challenges that we face societally and, and individually. And we know a lot of a lot of it isn't working. A lot of the ideology and dogma um, that that um, undergirds our our society 
uh, isn't sort of uh, all it's up, all it's cracked up to be. Um, so that there might be a great deal of wisdom that we could um, that we could apply and uh, and improve on on the situation we're in. Um, a couple more specific points. Um, you, I, I absolutely agree that um, there's nothing we've never seen anything like the um, the speed, the speediness, the sheer pace of of life um, as as compared to the way it's lived today. Um, I do think though that some of the challenges that come with um, with contemporary life do have antecedents in um, even as long ago as say 100 or 150 years ago with the dawn of the industrial revolution and uh, and then really truly mass societies and mass institutions um, we had this sort of more atomistic uh, fragmented even a fully anonymous uh, sort of way of life in which um, people fully depended on on people they would never meet and couldn't possibly interact with in a in a direct way and so you know what we're dealing with now I think is a is a much fuller expression but it's it's a version of the same challenge we've known for some time um, <clears throat> I think, and I'm glad you alluded to economics, because I think that ideology or that um, that way of being in the world in which we basically look after ourselves, take care of our own, and um, often forget everybody else is manifest most fully in our contemporary economic thinking, um, where we are, I, I mean, I, I went and I was, I was flabbergasted to be taught a, a version of economics that's completely mainstream, in which the fundamental premises are uh, are just nakedly absurd, in which people are described as completely self-seeking, um, in which people are described as totally rational decision makers, um, perfectly transparent. To, their desires are perfectly transparent to them, and they're perfectly capable of sort of seeking them in an accurate and effective way. Um, I mean, they basically tell you our discipline, or much of our discipline, is built on on these assumptions, and we kind of recognize that they're questionable. Um, but we're not going to really pay any attention to that. We're just going to speed right along ahead and, and into the models. That's fine, maybe, if you keep in mind that what you're doing is a purely academic exercise that might illustrate something about the function of an, of an economy, but probably tells you very little about how actual human beings work and live and achieve satisfaction. The trouble is when that distinction gets lost, and it, it basically almost always does in public discourse. And this is, this is something that's been irking me for quite a while that I've been trying to call attention to. Um, the vision of a human being that is um, proffered and, um, by you know, contemporary economic lights um, is completely, uh, not completely, but almost, in completely, almost completely vacuous. Um, has nothing to do with human beings that you and I have ever met um, or would want to meet, for that matter. And, um, and because economics and contemporary economics, economic thinking is so powerful and is such a driver for, um, of, of politics, is such a major part of our politics, it seems to me really crucial that we get it right, that we get a vision of a human being right if it's going to be um, such a primary part of our discourse. Here, here's an interesting question. I'm, I'm wondering as you're saying that because I, 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 I find it very fascinating and, and I, I seem to remember even, you know, my, you know, the initial economics classes that I took in college, you know, that that was the basic fundamental assumption behind both our economics and our political structure. Mm -hmm. It had the same kind of um, assumptions. And, you know, and, and since then I've thought, oh yeah, that is a, it is a really limited view of what a human being is and definitely out of sync with my experience. Um, that said, I mean, what, are, are we trying to create a system or are we trying to create systems that are reflective of how human beings actually are or are we trying to create systems reflective of what human beings could become? And I think that's a kind of, just a question that comes up for me because I think anytime we go into the latter, you know, there, there are challenges related to um, ignoring human nature, you know, at least some parts of human nature. That we are, you know, sometimes self-interested, greedy, you know, myopic beings, um, mm -hmm. and then you get sort of an idealism, you know, that that becomes the basis for a system. And how well does that really work, you know? And then how do you find um, what the nature of a human being actually is? Because isn't that something that changes um, once once you start exploring it? Anyway, just just a few, you know, simple thoughts. Just simple <laughs> questions for you. Right. <laughs> yeah, give me thirty seconds. I'll have that all wrapped up. Um, <laughs> no, I, th uh, yeah, absolutely. Those are great questions, and I, 
Um, and in a way, I think, um, uh, let me step back a second. I, I really appreciate the distinction. Um, I certainly don't want to stand on um, some vision of, of, um, of what we are that, um, that I'm, uh, frankly, I'm, you know, I, I believe what I told you earlier, but I'm, you know, I'm not ready to really preach it as, as the gospel from, from the mountaintops. I mean, I, I've seen it. I've got some confidence. I want to explore more. I've got some questions, too. Um, and, but I certainly, I, I, and I, I want to pursue it in part because um, it feels like there's a germ of truth there, and it runs so counter to everything, to nearly everything that our um, contemporary political discourse suggests that I, I think, well, gosh, um, if there's salvific potential here, it's really, it's doubly worth pursuing, um, both for me personally, but perhaps also this discourse that may have gone awry. Um, I, you know, in a way, I sort of think we don't need to answer the, the question that you asked, um, if only because the vision of a human being that's, um, that's offered to us, and, and I don't mean from marginal sources, I don't mean from Fox News, I mean out of the mouths of even, um, you know, our president or our, um, perhaps even some of the mainstream politicians about whom we might feel the best, we still have, I think, in the main, a pretty truncated version, uh, a vision of what a human being is, not just could be, but is. And in a, in a way, I think the task is, um, my t the, the task that I feel called to um, perform is just trying to complicate that vision, just trying to offer up the missing pieces of the puzzle, or at least the ones that I you know, happen to have stumbled across or feel like I have to offer. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't think I have any monopoly on it either, but um, I, I guess... It feels like a very critical task, um, and both I mean that in both senses of the word, important, but also critical about criticism, that um, the, the vision of humanity, of what we're capable of, of how we might be toward ourselves and others that we're offered um, by most of our mainstream culture is, um, is missing something. And, and I think you know, one task that I would love to see uh, more folks that I went to school with, more folks in the Buddhist communities that, I'm, that I know, uh, more folks uh, of other stripes take up is is that task of pushing back every single time we're asked to believe something about us that falls short or sells us short of what we are and could be. Okay. Okay. Cool. So, um, do you, do you could you share some like specific thoughts of of like how you might see the the um, the political space being different if it were infused with with a, a bit more of this kind of a uh, recognition of basic goodness or or compassion or Buddha nature. Yeah. So actually, I'm going to take a slight left turn here and and talk about free will for just a second. Okay. Because um, I think it's I think it's related, and I'll I'll swing right back to your question. Great. So at the beginning of his recent book, Sam Harris uh, on free will, it's called Free Will. Sam Harris makes the point that. Um, Republicans tend to be a little bit more, in some cases, a lot more enamored of the notion of free will than Democrats are. For Republicans, there's this idea that, um, for many Republicans anyway, there's this idea that no matter your circumstances, no matter your economic misfortune, um, you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you can achieve the American dream, and so on. Um, Democrats tend to be a little more, um, I, I guess I want to say, aware of the power of circumstance to shape and limit the choices and capacities we have as individuals. Um, I think that's true. Um, and, uh, and I think free will would be another great uh, topic of conversation one day. Um, mm -hmm. But I think the same, I think that split, that basic, uh, um, that basic distinction between the parties is also there when it, and in fact it's, it's nearly the same distinction, is there when it comes to our understanding of what it is to be a human being. For the Republican Party, there's um, much of the party is still enamored of this image of, of Ronald Reagan and the rugged frontier individualist, this uh, self-made man. I mean, all of these hoary um, fairy tales, essentially. And unfortunately, the Democratic Party is pretty bound up in them too, because to be at all successful in American politics today, you've got to nod in that direction. Thankfully, um, the Democratic Party tends to also nod a little bit more. Um, and this president in particular tends to nod more in the direction of an awareness that um, whatever the ultimate metaphysical truth of the matter, um, as a practical matter, we are all deeply bound up in each other's lives. 
And uh, the president gave a speech, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, and I remember being both excited and exasperated um, because he he basically framed uh, the history of American political philosophy in terms of these two threads: the first being the rugged individualist, and the second being this awareness of the power and necessity and integral uh, fabric of community in our lives. Um, and he unfortunately put them in that order. He said, "There's also been this second tradition, you know, of of the." of all the community interrelationality inter and all this other stuff. And I remember thinking, I get what you're doing rhetorically, and I get why you did it, um, but gosh, the second thing is actually much more true. And if, if I had my way, and I think if perhaps if um, Buddhist teachings, if not actual Buddhists themselves, had a bigger influence on politics, that strain and that understanding would have a much bigger role to play. Um, we would come to understand the, the ways that our own individual lives are so fully formed by the influences on us, by our genetics, by our surroundings and our, our parenting, by our friends and the communities and the, the, that we're a part of and the influences that work on us, um, that we wouldn't, we wouldn't be nearly so prey to these illusions about you know, self-created people and up by the bootstraps and all the rest of it. Okay, it's interesting. Yeah, no, I've, I've heard that distinction made as well um, um, by a philosopher named Ken Wilber. And he talked about, you know, the, the distinction between those parties in terms of one focusing on the individual and the other focusing on, on the collective or on the, on the kind of, um, you know, the collection of individuals that makes up that collective. Mm. And um, I found that a really helpful distinction. And I, I kind of have wondered sometimes, though, too, if, you know, if sometimes we can go too far, you know, to, toward the end, that one side of the collective, you know, and sort of, mitigate the degree to which individuals can be very powerful agents of change in the right circumstances. Um, I mean... Are there... Sorry, go ahead. Well, so some of the people you mentioned earlier, you know, uh, Martin Luther or Gandhi, you know, there's certain certain individuals, and for whatever reasons, maybe and maybe a lot of it is based on, on timing and based on a lot of factors that had to come together for those individuals to be that, um, and yet, still, you know, they they were clearly important figureheads, or or important, you know, their actions actually did seem to have some sort of broader impact that imp impacted a lot of systems and a lot of people. Um, so, I, I wonder, you know, is it is it is it kind of an either or, or is there is there a spectrum there? Like, it's a great question, and I, it's one that I'm still wrestling with. In fact. Um, <laughs> Every time I lift up King and Gandhi as, as examples of um, what could be, mm -hmm. uh, I have a friend of mine who pushes back on my blog um, and always insists uh, that I acknowledge the, the thousands of unnamed people um, in each of those movements without whom nothing would have ever happened. Um, right, right. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's a confusing thing to me. I mean, on one hand, I think these people were they were not, I don't think they were replaceable. Um, they were singularly talented, singularly charismatic, singularly influential. Um, by the same token, the qualities that they uh, expressed and represented, the, in King's case perhaps particularly, the unbelievable love uh, that was in his heart uh, that, that, for example, enabled him to stand on the porch of his just bombed house and tell all the would-be vigilantes that came to you know support him and take take revenge um, that that's not what what this movement was about that they were needed to be about something much bigger and, and more loving than that I mean that's that's a kind of love that um, that I would love to see uh, um, cultivated in everybody in every in every school child um, not just as a sort of far away remote example that you celebrate every January 16th or whatever the holiday is. Um, but it's something that um, we should all truly strive for, and I, I suspect that if we had a culture um, that valued, for example, King um, in a much deeper and more full-fledged way, one that actually saw his virtues as, as worth teaching and cultivating, then, you know, while you certainly can never guarantee that somebody like him is going to come around again, um, you'd have a whole lot more people running around and creating movements and working for change with um, with great stores of that very love and compassion, and uh, maybe you wouldn't need somebody quite like him. I don't know. Yeah, it's such a, such an interesting question. I remember I was watching. Uh, I was on Martin Luther King Day, uh, this incredible documentary about about his life, and there was one. I was sitting there with my dad watching this, and there was one 
there's one thing that, that he supposedly said that really struck me, and I was, I was shocked to hear it, and he said at one point that history has me. <laughs> and I thought that was such an interesting point, you know, to, to kind of acknowledge the way that he was bound up in these historical forces. Mm -hmm. um, and that in a certain way, like in a certain sense, his life wasn't really his anymore. I mean, that mm -hmm. statement seemed to imply that, you know, like a deep recognition of, of, of bigger causes and conditions. And yet, you know, who in those particular circumstances, you know, would really go with that and, and, and sacrifice so much in terms of personal happiness, you know, in terms of pleasure or, you know, safety or, you know, some of the things we value a lot. Um, <laughs> and and, and, and I, I sometimes wonder, like, is it, is it those circumstances, you know, that, that lead to such a, a person becoming such a, an amazing like, shining light of love, um, you know, or, or is it the other way around? It's the shining light of love that enables him to be in the circumstances, you know, or both. I don't know. But it is such a cool, it's such a good question. He's, he's such a, I think, just a rich, um, a rich topic of, or a rich, uh, you know, a rich subject of exploration uh, for precisely this reason, because um, there's a really, uh, in his, uh, in some of his writings, his early writings, there's a, a scene in which he recounts, um, and this is an early part of the movement before uh, a lot of the, the, the violence and the threats of violence that came his way. Um, he's sitting at his kitchen table and is, you know, asking, in his case, asking God for guidance because he's really confused, uncertain that he's up to the task. Um, and I, I guess I want to, my, I guess my intuition is to say that, um, you know, the Martin Luther King of 55 probably wasn't, you know, wasn't ready to do the things that the Martin Luther King of 68 did, but at some, you know, that life kept unfolding and, um, you know, kept uh, manifesting greater and greater capacities of love and compassion as, as, as you say, as history took him. Um, I, uh, I, you know, one of the, thing that's, the things that's most interesting to me about him is how, um, and this is deeply related to what we're talking about, is you know obviously this is a, a Christian preacher deeply steeped in the in the uh, heritage of the Black Church, and yet in some ways seem to embody um, the kind of pure love, the deep selflessness in many ways that um, Buddhists often look to in, in some of their highest and uh, most revered teachers. So <clears throat> in a way, you know when I get uh, a little down in the dumps about um, how marginal Buddhism often feels in America. I, I, I often look to him as a reminder that what I'm, not, what I'm hoping for is not that something called Buddhism attains prominence, right. but rather that the teachings, and particularly the teachings about how we might be capable of being better to ourselves and to others, um, those, I think, are you know, more universal than any, than, any, um, than any label, and they have a proud and, and uh, towering exemplar in him, so, which, which might well suggest that... Um, you know, there's there's more receptivity to this stuff and, and more hunger for this stuff out there, even in the home of uh, you know rugged individualism than than you might otherwise think. Mm. Cool. So um, maybe just to wrap up, uh, I was wondering if you could share any you know your favorite kind of uh, authors or people that are also exploring the space of Buddhism and and politics because um, I've had several people in the past ask me you know who 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 would you suggest looking at here and I don't know if it's just my own kind of uh, biases or, or if it's really just kind of hard to find some of these folks, but um, I haven't really ever had any good sources for people. So I was wondering if you could share some of your favorites. That way if folks are more interested in kind of diving deep into this topic, they can. And I'd also mention before you do that that thewheatandchaff.com is also a really good place to, to go and check that out. I've, I've seen a bunch of new people from just reading your blog that... Um, that are kind of in line with this, but anyway. Oh, well, thanks. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> the name that comes to mind first is a fellow named Peter Hershock, H-E-R-S-H-O-C-K. Uh, -E uh, he's a scholar out in Hawaii and has a book called Buddhism in the Public Sphere that is, um, of all the stuff I've read so far, and that's not by any means exhaustive, um, is the most engaged with... <coughs> excuse me, um, is the most engaged with the um, really specific nuances of a 
American politics. Excuse me, I'm just going to grab a sip of water. Yeah, sure, go for it. <clears throat> Don't worry, we'll we'll edit we'll edit this part out oh, where you're oh, choking to death. <laughs> <laughs> well, in that case, I'm going to take a leisurely sip. <laughs> go for it. Um, yeah, he, so the name that comes to mind is Peter Hershock, um, a, a scholar out in Hawaii who has a book called Buddhism in the Public Sphere that is, of, of what I've seen, which is certainly not exhaustive, is um, the most specifically engaged with the nuances of American politics and policymaking. So the way the book works is he's got a chapter on each of eight or nine policy areas, including um, anti-terror policy, the environment, etc. <clears throat> and, and he does what very few Buddhist authors do, which is um, not just talk in general about uh, how about um, or not just exhort the reader in general to apply um, Buddhist patience or Buddhist creativity or Buddhist compassion to a thorny policy problem, but actually gets into the weeds of the specific challenges that um, that the policy problem creates, and then also that are faced by <coughs> um, that are faced by would-be change agents. Excuse me. Um, I've I've read some. Um, I actually think that um, Chogyam Chungpa, who you know I'm partial to, has um, <clears throat> has a lot of wise stuff to say. Not so much about the specific vicissitudes and exigencies of American politics per se, <clears throat> but much more about the, what would we want to say, the temperaments, the traits of character that are required to engage effectively in politics. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you okay? Um, yeah, sorry. I'm I'm getting about thirty seconds of um, a voice, and then it dis and then it sinks again. So let me let me get a little more water. Yeah, sure. But, you know, I actually think that's, um, I think there's two sides of this uh, whole thing. There's the question of um, how to apply Buddhist teachings in a sophisticated way um, when we face the specific challenges we face. Um, but then there's also, I, I, I don't think it's any less valuable, the um, more general reminders of the magnitudes of the challenges we're going to face when we go into worlds like the political sphere. And so for that, I don't necessarily think you need um, writers steeped in the details of policy or politics, um, but you just need some, some general exposure to wisdom. I mean, I go back to the same authors over and over just because mm. um, like a good meal or a good family or something, they provide a constant source of support. Great. Okay, cool. Sweet. Well, thank you so much, Matt, for joining us and exploring, um, you know, the politics of Buddha nature. Um, I think we've covered some it's interesting been a territory. Yeah, it has. Um, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe we could take. If your voice holds, we could take one question from someone who's been tuning in live. Um, Absolutely. Okay. Cool. So uh, this is a question from Susan Law, who's been joining us uh, throughout. She says, uh, how, how important do you think it is for Buddhists to simply embody, embody their, our, principles as opposed to pursuing a particular agenda explicitly? That sort of ties, I guess, into what you're just saying in a way. That is, that's the, sing the single most um, <clears throat> confounding question to me because, um, you know, as I've, I've been writing a lot about honesty and um, as you and Susan know, um, the political sphere requires a great deal of dishonesty. Um, so I think a lot about Vimalakirti, uh, the ancient Buddhist Indian saint, um, who had this capacity to, um, as you know, mythically speaking, had this capacity to sort of transform himself into um, uh, into any shape that was needed. Um, 
<clears throat> into any situation and to be effective in it. Um, I tend to think that um, we'll serve uh, we'll serve the world best by sticking as close to those principles as we can, mm. um, if only because they're they're so often so underrepresented. And to get a chance to grow, they need a chance to see the light um, and for others to see them. But um, <clears throat> politics is a complicated thing, and I, I certainly don't want to speak too sweepingly or um, uh, too, too overconfidently either. Um, I think it's just a, a tricky set of spaces to operate in. Mm. OK, great. Thank you. Cool. So um, yeah, I think, I think we're good. Excellent. Awesome. I'm going to go ahead and drop off uh, the broadcast, and we'll, we'll just check in real quick.